Golf Smarter Number 677 is brought to you by Peter Millar Golf. Go to petermillar.com slash golfsmarter to use my link and receive complimentary shipping and a free hat with your order. Have you heard that we're giving away three $100 Amazon gift cards? Register to win one of them, courtesy of autoslash.com. Register right now at golfsmarter.com slash autoslash. Now, what you're about to hear is a replay of an early episode with Tony Manzoni. Details after the interview. One simple move, better golf forever with Tony Manzoni. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing tips and insights from golfers and golf professionals to help lower your score. It's worked for your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Tony. Hey, Fred, how are you? I am so glad to hear your voice once again. We had such a great time when we came down to Palm Desert and and spent that morning with you. Thank you so much. My buddy Neil and I uh, came down to Palm Desert and played some golf. But before we even started our golf, we got a chance about an hour, hour and a half to to give Neil a lesson. Neil had never had, he's been playing golf most of his life. He's never had a lesson. This is the first time that he'd ever had a lesson. And I was able to capture it on video with two different cameras running at the same time. So I'm very excited to announce that not only is this podcast now available, but a a video of Neil's lesson given by Tony Manzoni. The very first lesson on video by Tony Manzoni has been posted to YouTube and the Golf Smarter TV channel. I'm so excited. Thank you. That was great fun, I'll tell you that. And, and uh, Neil responded. Uh, I wish I could get everyone to, to do it that quickly. It was it really was terrific. Yeah, and it was funny because all during the uh, round of golf that we had that day in 35 mile an hour winds, <laughs> he was like, you know, he was so focused on on what he had learned from you that morning, and even after our round that he he didn't say, he said just don't write down my score. I don't want to know about score. I said good for you because you're working on something. And then after the round of golf, um, we went back to the driving range, and he worked even harder on it. And uh, and one more thing, he had never gone to the driving range after a round of golf. Is there a lot of um, value for golf, for players? Because we always see the guys on the tour they go to the driving range after a round of golf. Is that a good thing for us to do? Oh, sure, because you, you, know, you, you, you have a real clear memory of what just transpired on the golf course and some of the things that didn't work out, and, and that's where you work a lot. I mean, Ben Hogan was, uh, was one of the first pros to do that uh, when he got through with a round of golf and, and shot an incredible score in, in most cases and still was out there practicing because he, did, he had a two-iron that he didn't like or so forth. So it's very beneficial for people to do that at any level fabulous well let's talk about congratulations your book is now available and we have it on our uh on on our website at golfsmarter.com in our golfers mart we're going to feature it in the golfers mart and it's going to be highly visible uh it's called the lost fundamental one simple move better golf forever and that really is your theory, huh? It's it's if you understand the move, you can adjust it yourself, and it's going to change your game. Well, it, it, it's very simple, and when you when you purchase the book, and I hope you will, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, <laughs> I think you'll be amazed at the brevity of the book. And, and I did that intentionally. Um, I've only had one negative comment of all the people I've sent this book to, and I've sent it to a lot. One fellow that thought it was more of a pamphlet and it really isn't but <laughs> when i was writing the book the, it was it was becoming a great american novel and paul cervantes who was very helpful uh, in the writing of this book uh helped me reduce my thoughts to to, to make them simple and and i can tell you that i've had more uh, uh people write me and say thank you for making this thing so simple because most golf books, uh, you, you start falling asleep because they get into such uh, detail. And I really believe that if you do certain things in the golf swing, that there's a domino effect that, that, that happens. And we don't have to deal with those pieces. Uh, cause and effect is, is everything. So if I can set you up to the golf ball properly and you finish in a position relative to, to the ball properly, a lot of things are going to occur. And that's, that's what I find is happening. Well, and it's not just that the book is brief, but the descriptions are fairly brief. I mean, you can go through two pages and get two or three descriptions of what you're trying to explain, which, again, I think is incredibly helpful. 
Well, that 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 was my intention is to say it say it again and then say it again, uh, mm-hmm. because really uh, there's just a few core moves that you have to uh, learn. And gosh, uh, it, it's like a miracle. I mean, you could see what happened with Neil. I mean, he hit some tremendous shots with mm-hmm. no side spin, uh, with great trajectory. After just a few m- minutes of do this, do that, and and he got right into it. Well, he did, and when he made a shot um, when we were playing together, he knew what he did right and what he did wrong after each shot. It was really fascinating because I've seen people who had taken lessons and were working on so many things at once, but it it just seemed so simple to him, so clear, that with every shot that he took, he got it, Um, and he knew what he had to adjust. Yeah, as I told him, you can either be a disconnector and rotate the arms, or you can be connected and rotate the body. Um, and 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 actually, when you pull the arms down in the, in the downswing and detach them from the body, um, that's when thin, fat shots occur because it holds you behind the ball. Uh, so you can you can play the game of golf and not blame your swing so much. It's just one action that you that you're that you're doing that you need to not do, and that would be to stay connected and not drop the arm. Uh, you know, we all play golf. Uh, for those of us that have played golf for a long time, we were taught to do that: pull the arm down, pull down on the ball, hit down on the ball. All those phrases, and what it does is it just gets one part working. That's the arms and hands, where the body just stalls out. So we, we're losing all the power of the core. And I wish I had just discovered this a little bit earlier in my life than now, but but it's improved my game dramatically. I, I'm hitting the ball so much farther than I have in, say, 30 years. And I find oh, yeah. that with all my students. That's that's really unbelievable that you're getting more distance. Neil definitely was getting more distance, um, although I, I I don't know why, but I was still out driving him that day. And he goes, well, how come you're out driving me? I said, because I'm older than you. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, that's not right. Um, so let, let's go over this. Um, well, also, let me let me just say the other part about the book that I found so much fun. First of all, there's photographs, so you have a really clear description of exactly what you're talking about. But then at the end, you have stories of people that you've come across and people you've uh, met and and dedicated the book to. So really, the book flies right by. It's it's really really helpful and. Um, that's one of the things that I think that people should be checking this book out. Uh, it's, it's a worthwhile, it's not an investment, um, but it's definitely worth coming to uh, golfsmarter.com and, and checking out The Lost Fundamental by Tony Manzoni. It's a really helpful book. And there have been a lot of, lot of Golf Smarter listeners who have been in touch with you, haven't they? Oh, absolutely. I've had a, a tremendous amount that I, that I talk with via email or that have come down physically and taken a golf lesson from me. Uh, we had a we had a golf school uh, called the Single Pivot Golf School, and we, we did five schools, and they were really, really well received. But I continually get uh, mail from folks that have heard about me on Golf Golf Smarter. I, I, I had no idea that you had such a uh, such an audience. It's incredible. Well, it's an active group, and they're passionate about their golf, and that's why I think that uh, they reached out to you because you you're pretty clear on what you're talking about, and it's not too convoluted there's not a lot going on at once i hope so because that's you know that's my intention uh i was like a lot of instructors for years um just kind of pontificating all this golf dogma and you know you can see the people's eyes just glaze over uh and no one was gonna no one is gonna tell you gee i don't know what you mean they're just going to let it go over their head, and then you'll never see them again. So I, I realized early on in my golf teaching that there had to be a better way than this. And then luckily for me, I started looking at Ben Hogan and reading everything I could about the man. And that's how I formed uh, this method, because it really is born out of that period of time. Hmm. I'll tell you, it's interesting because when I'm – when I'm uh, directing a video shoot or when I'm doing the shoot, when I'm the camera person uh, or I have multiple cameras going, anything like that. And that's, that's pretty much what my career has been is, is a recording engineer, both video and audio. It's very hard for me to concentrate on the content while I'm doing it. So when I'm um, recording somebody else, I'll miss a lot of what the conversation is because I'm watching the dials and knobs and everything to make sure that, that the production value is right. I can't believe that I, As far as I know, I only took away from Neil's lesson, I took away two major points 
that when we played golf that weekend, we played two rounds after that um, on, on um, you know, like one day right after the next, how much straighter the ball was, uh, the ball flight was for me. I generally have a slight fade to the ball. I was hitting the ball much straighter because of two things that I picked up from the lesson. One is on my backswing, um, as much as I try to keep my lower body quiet, I still have a tendency to have my left knee bend in, pointing across my body. But what I got from you was keeping the left knee pointed straight, straight ahead. That's correct. That's correct. That was huge for me. Yeah, it stabilizes the stance, and and it, and it, uh, it allows you not to put weight uh, on the right side, which we're, we're, we really don't want to do. We want to stay on the front side weight-wise. In fact, um, when we set to the ball, we brace left, and then as we coil the body, it display, displaces the weight backwards it, uh, you know, via the right shoulder, right hip. Uh, we actually put more weight against the brace and steepen the brace of the right leg. Um, that makes the right leg really light. And all you have to do from that point there, because you're at impact already, from there you just rotate your upper body. The legs stay, because they're underneath you, they stay right with you. And it's just so much simpler to get to the left side, totally to the left side, where your chest is really left of the target. Uh, when you're moving side to side, it's really hard to get to that point uh, for anybody, really. Unbelievable. I, I want to uh, stop right now um, and ask you about uh, a book recommendation uh, because this episode of the Golf Smarter Podcast is brought to you by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks. They have more than 75,000 downloadable titles right to your computer across all types of literature. Actually, you can download it to your computer or your mobile device. Um, and, and they have uh, fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. Now, we would like for you to check out Audible for yourself and so we're offering a free audiobook of your choice go to their vast library and pick anything you'd like all you'd have to do is go to audiblepodcast.com slash golf smarter and we want to make a recommendation have you ever um i found a book that we hadn't talked about yet have you did you ever have any contact with jack nicholas tony well, uh, you know, I met Jack on a couple of occasions, and then recently, a good friend of mine, uh, Tony Trelato, uh, who uh, builds wine for Luke Donald and uh, a number of the great players, is also uh, making wine for Jack Nicholas. And an article came, an article came out about me, and, and Tony sent me a nice picture of him and Jack, and Jack holding this article. So that was that was quite quite nice for me. Wow. But, um, you know, he's one of the, I mean, he is probably the greatest golfer of all time when it comes to scoring, hitting the ball long, hitting the ball accurately, and, and putting great under pressure. I don't think anyone's ever reached his level. If Ben Hogan could have putted like Jack Nicholas, I think he would have shot in the 50s on a lot of occasions. <laughs> oh, man. Um, Tony Chilato is actually, you talk about in your book. He's one of the uh, people in the back of the book where you give stories about. Right. Yes, that's right. He's he's, he's become a great friend. Uh, he's a giant in the in the wine industry and premium wines. And like I say, they make the wine for Luke Donald. I think Ernie Els also, and and now Jack Nicholas. Um, and he's 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 a tr- tremendously passionate person, not only about food and drink, but also about golf. So we have spent many hours uh, tearing through everything that we could find about Ben Hogan. Wow. Well, back to Jack Nicholas because uh, the book Jack Nicholas, My Story, the unabridged version by Jack Nicholas and Ken Bowden, is available at audiblepodcast.com slash golf smarter, and you can get it for free. It's, uh, it's over 18 and a half hours long, so you'll get the entire story is narrated by Ian Esmo. And again, um, all you have to do is go to audiblepodcast.com slash golf smarter and download anything you like. Or if you'd like to try the Jack Nicholas, my story book, you can do that too. But 75,000 titles to choose from. So audible, A U D I B L E, audiblepodcast.com slash golf smarter. Awesome. Now, you, you talked about Hogan shooting into the 50s. You actually have shot in, you were telling me this one story. I'm still trying to get the full grasp of this what's your lowest round uh 61 uh and it was on a funny day because uh the day before uh the club announced to me that they wanted a 
put a, some kind of a biography of myself and my, my past in the paper, and they were hiring me as the head professional. Uh, this was going to be my first job as head professional. I had a big party the night before and a lot of pats on the back, and the next morning the, the manager told me, well, wait a minute now, we have we spoke a little too soon. We have to talk to one more applicant. And as it turned out, they chose the applicant. Why, did he not shoot a 60? No, he, he just had more experience. And, but, but not only did I get the job, but they announced to me that he was bringing his own staff in, so I was going to be out of a job in 30 days. <laughs> so a couple of them, yeah, I know, it was really, a, I can remember it. A couple of members says, come on, pro, let's go out, let's go play. So we played the golf course, and it was kind of a blur to me. And when I put it out on the last hole, they said, you know, you just broke Ben Terry's record. He shot 61. Well, first of all, we mentioned in the same you know category with Ken Venturi. You know, right. I should have been falling to my knees and thank God. But just like all golfers, the first thing that's eked out of my pea brain was, gee, and I didn't birdie a par five, which I had. But you know, that was my next question. Of... <laughs> <laughs> you really were, so like... we're never satisfied, right? Is that really true that you were you, you like that? Oh, there was one hole I should have had. I should have, would have, coulda, right? Yeah, we all we all do that. I, I I say that to my golf team all the time. You know, no matter what we do out there, we always we always come back with I could have done this. You know, uh, sometimes we're not really thankful for the blessings we get when it comes to golf. Did you really not realize how you were shooting during the round? I had no idea. In fact, to this day, uh, I, I have very little memory of it. I was in such a funk about not only getting losing my job and everything, but the night before, you know, I had all these close friends patting me on the back, telling me, great job, and all these things. Now I had to go back and tell them, hey, I'm not working at Alameda anymore. You know, this, this is going to be the shortest job career of all time. <laughs> uh, so, you know, wait, it, wait. It really, I mean, now I look back at it and I laugh about it, but then it was, it was pretty serious stuff. Wait, now i got to get the time frame correct here. You had the big party, and the next day you went out and shot a 61? Well, I, yeah, the next day I, you know, the next day I, I couldn't wait to get to the course. I had all these ideas I was going to do. You know, we just had a shell, the, the previous protest, everything. I mean, I almost took the pain off the walls. But I had an idea of all the things I was going to do. And then I was put on hold until the afternoon. They said, don't worry, we've got one more applicant, no big deal. And, of course, when the manager came in about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, his face was white because I knew, yeah, and he couldn't yeah. even look at me. And when he announced to me that not only didn't I have a job. So the celebration but, was not about shooting 61. The celebration was because you had you had gotten your first head pro job. That's correct. That's correct. And you so went now, out and shot a 61 after all that celebrating, and and it was a, a competitive round? No, it was just a round. A couple of members just felt so bad for oh, me. Oh, okay. They said, come on, pro, let's go out and play, because they heard, they heard what had happened. Because, you know, a lot of people at the club had, said, great job, we're really happy to have you as our new pro. But the management company, which owned the golf course, had, had uh, made the decision to hire this fellow that had more uh, experience. And I understood that, but it still it was like a kick in the groin, I can tell you that. <laughs> so when I went out to play, and that was on my mind. Uh, how, what am I going to say? How am I, what, what am I, where am I going to get a job? All these things. So I was kind of playing from my subconscious, which is what we really need to do, obviously. And, um, and as it turned out, I shot a great score. And I think that, that I'm pretty sure that record is still uh, in place. At the Almaden? Yes. Almaden Country Club? Is that what it is? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, so you, and the, you don't remember the round. I mean, you can't tell me. Do you know how many, um, Pars that you had in that round, or how many? No, I wouldn't. I, 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 all I know is I, I was aware that I had not birdied the par five. That's the only thing I was aware about. But uh, you know, I made obviously made a lot of birdies by shot obviously. sixty-one. Yeah, I, I don't believe I made any bogeys. Uh, I think I, I hold out from the fairway once for a two uh, out of par four. So you had one, e- I, one eagle. Of- you think you had one eagle, right? Yeah, the rest of it, yeah, the rest of it was birdies, I think, and and uh, and really, I I I love to be able to say, well, I had ten birdies, but I I I don't remember it because it was, it wasn't in my mind or in my heart while I was doing this. I was just thinking of how embarrassed I felt and how I was going to tell all my friends. Well, I spoke too soon, and I really hadn't spoke too soon. I was told you got the job, okay, um, but you know, it was it was just a an awkward position to be in. And then, of course, now I'm out of a job in 30 days. You know, I'm a young guy. I'm used to being able to go out and have a fun time and 
play golf and do that. And now I'm, now I'm panicking. You know, I don't have a job. So, uh, it, it was just a strange set of circumstances that created this marvelous round of golf. I can't, I, I can't say that I was practicing really hard before an event. And I went did this, uh, although I, I played all this, you know, as an assistant pro, I played almost all the time. So, and that was my home course, but 61 and 61, I don't care if you're playing miniature golf. That's a good one. <laughs> so there is, there's gotta be a lesson in there somehow, somewhere about not paying attention to your score. Oh, well, there's no two ways about it. I mean, I'm sure the listening audience will be nodding their head when you, sometimes you don't feel real good or maybe you've been out a little late and had a few too many cocktails and the next day you go out and shoot a great round. And I think it's because we're we're not so conscious of what we're doing or trying to do anything. We just go ahead and swing and, let, and getting out of the way of ourselves. And I think the touring pros have a way to do that where they let the subconscious take over. Uh, anytime you do anything consciously, I think you get a little bit awkward. Uh, and, and so when we're learning how to play golf, we've got to do the learning on the, on the driving range, and then we've got to trust the fact that we know what we're doing and go on the golf course and just get target-oriented and let it go. Uh, and that's easier said than done. This episode of the Golf Smarter Podcast is brought to you by Peter Millar. And as this episode is being published, I told you I'm on vacation now and publish these in advance, I'm traveling in Uganda, and according to my itinerary, I'm in the jungle of Bwindi trekking with gorillas. <laughs> it's a long and arduous hike, and because comfort is so important on this trip, I've packed my five-pocket pants from Peter Millar. Yeah, I I'm a five-pocket kind of guy when it comes to my pants. If I'm not on the golf course, I can usually be found wearing a classic five-pocket jean. But I'm not bringing jeans on this trip. And that's why I'm bringing my Peter Millar five pocket pants. What I love about them is that they offer so much comfort and style that they're even acceptable while traveling through the jungle, going out to dinner on our layover in Dubai, or even playing golf. They're lightweight, highly breathable, made of the highest quality Pima cotton, and have comfort stretch for ease of movement through the jungle <laughs> and through the golf course. And like your favorite jeans, the Peter Millar Five Pocket Pants have the style to be worn anywhere in the world. They have Peter Millar's exclusive wash and finish to enhance the softness, which is also why I brought them. So when I come home, I can clean them up and they'll be perfect and ready to go out to dinner. So the reason I brought these Five Pocket Pants is because they're probably the most comfortable pair of pants I've ever worn. I can say that about almost everything I've ever worn from Peter Millar. No, actually, I can say that about everything I've worn from Peter Millar. And right now, you can head over to petermillar.com slash golfsmarter to check out some of my Peter Millar favorites. Be sure to use my link and you'll receive complimentary shipping and a free Peter Millar hat. That's petermillar, M-I-L-L-A-R, petermillar.com slash golfsmarter. That's petermillar.com slash golfsmarter. I have a friend, uh, John Leland, who writes a blog called Joy of Golfing, uh, joyofgolfing.com, not breaking 80 with joy and learning. He's, um, he, he's never had the ability. He's never broken 80 in any of his rounds. And just recently, he had uh, the round, the front nine of his life, and he, got, he took a peek at his scorecard and started figuring out what he needed to do just to stay consistent with this and how he could do it. Um, you know, cause I think he shot a 38 or a 39 on the front. So he's like, uh, this is it. This is the round I'm going to do it. And of course he shot an 83, which is probably one of his better rounds ever. But still, once he started figuring sure. out what he needed to get, the pressure was on and just no way it's going to happen. Sure. Well, you know, there's been so much written by so many of the psychologists, uh, these uh, people that feel they have to, you know, be happy when you go. There was one pro there, I can't recall his name, but his, his uh, gurus told him to have a smile on his face no matter what happened. Well, near the end of the round, he looked like a lunatic. I mean, this big you know, grin uh, that didn't relate to anything. Uh, and he did play pretty well. But then the next week when he tried it, it didn't work at all. And, and you know, those kinds of uh, uh, cliched things never work. Uh, it's, it's not that. 
And there's not a, it's not that kind of a button because, again, that's a conscious thought to do something. Uh, it's just a feeling. It's like putting. You know, I tell my students, look, uh, if you don't feel like you're going to make the putt, you can have the purest stroke in the world. That's not going in. And if you feel like you're going to make the putt, you're not so consumed with take it back straight or do this or do that. You just roll the ball like you did when you were a kid and didn't understand put the putting. You just had a stick and a ball and you hit the ball. There's a lot to that. But it's so hard once you get some information. It's so hard to digest it and not keep regurgitating it mentally. Uh, and that's what we all do. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of why I like what I, but the method I've gone, because it's pretty simple stuff. It's not a lot of the how to do things. And, uh, and, and that's, I think that's the hard part about this game is letting go and trusting. Yeah. All right. So the last couple of minutes we have available and actually there's more than a couple of minutes, but I wanted, I want to really dig into, into your, um, your theory on the lost fundamental here and, and why it, it works versus what all the other instructors are pounding on us on TV and in print and, and our videos and everything else. You, you seem to think that this is the kind of fundamental that once you understand it, you can correct yourself and you don't need to work with a pro all the time. Uh, in its simplest form, we're playing off of one axis and we're connecting the arms to the body and rotating around that axis. That's primarily what we're doing. Uh, instead of shifting the weight to the right leg and then back to the left leg, which is, you know, is be, has been preached in, in the last few years, but many, many years ago uh, it wasn't preached. Because uh, if you look at Jack Nicholas, if you look at Arnold Palmer, if you look at Ben Hogan, those are all great players, and, and they did not move to the right. Now, they may have thought they were, but they were all rotating. They're all in that barrel. Okay, so if we if we eliminate that compensational move that we have to make from the right side back to the left, okay, and if we brace up against impact and merely coil from that point, if the left arm stays connected to the body and we uncoil, the club's got to come back to the starting position, time and time and time again, opposed to throwing a club off your body with your arms. And because the head of the club is heavier than the handle, the club head is going to rotate. So the club's going to be either open or closed most of the time. And therein lies the big problem. So you take that and then that transitional move of shifting the weight from almost all on the right side to almost all on the left side. My gosh, you know, that's just too much to do in a, in a millisecond. And that's why most people, they, they look, you know, if I, we have a driving range at the college, and you watch most people, they're on the right side when they hit the ball. They're just hanging back, as most people do. And, and someone will say, well, shift your weight. Well, that's the problem. They shifted their weight to the right side. And that is why they can't get off. You know, unless you're Nuria or somebody like that, a young guy that has total com- control of their body, you're going to be hanging back. And so you never hit it with your core. You never get the power that's within you. That's the thing that happens immediately when I start teaching people. I, they hit the ball higher and farther and with no side spin. And they look at me like, why hasn't someone told me this? Well, it's been out there for a long time. It just hasn't been articulated uh, in a simple form. I also found myself um, after Neil's lesson that uh, I was in a much more balanced position at finish than, especially with my driver, because usually, for some reason, uh, why would we do this? Uh, when I have my driver in my hand, I swing harder, not faster. I swing harder. And after um, after the swing, I am off balance and falling away from sure. from the swing. Usually, when the arms go first, when the arms go first, the body goes back. Mm-hmm. That's why uh, in, in one era, you know, your head moved away from the target on the down swing, and you ended up in the seat position. But with the rotary swing, you, you're, everything's moving through the ball. I mean, you look at Annika Sorensen, who was one of the greatest ball strikers I think of all time. Uh, everyone says she looked like she was looking at the target when she hit the ball. That's exactly what she was rotating towards the target. So she wasn't working underneath. She was working the level through the ball. Now, you get tremendous power this way. And on top of it, you get accuracy because the, the, the left arm's not rotating. It's staying. It's pressed against the chest. The chest turns open. The, the club head hits the ball. You know, the feeling is a lot like how a hockey player hits the puck with a stick. It's that same rotational motion. And that's why hockey players, most of them, are pretty good golfers. Hmm. The other thing that, that Neil was um, very 
um, impressed with, well, I think it was almost an epiphany, is the point that you were making to him about the fact that hitting the ball, making contact with the ball is not the end of the swing. No, absolutely. That's the middle of the swing. The ball is a point of reference to align the club to, but it cannot be a target. If you're focusing on the back of the ball, hitting the back of the ball, you're going to decelerate the club. We all decelerate to some form. Everyone does, the best player in the world. But you're going to really decelerate. You're going to shut the thing down, and your body's going to stop. What we want to do is we want to rotate past the golf ball, and the last thing that hits that golf ball is that club head. So you're moving through it as you hit it. Now you now you hit it with your core, and you're going to get you're, you get totally on the left side. You know, in my concept, you're 60 40 to start, 70 30 at the top, but you still got to get to 99 plus. You still got to get against that left side prior to hitting the golf ball, not not after hitting the golf ball, prior to hitting it. So by getting closer to that number, that 90 number, by because you're in the 70s, you can get against that left side and through it quicker. The center of gravity of the body of every human being is below, a couple inches below the navel. The closer that center of gravity is to the pivot leg, which is the left leg, the faster you pivot. It's just that's just that's science. That's not me. Okay. So uh, Ben Hogan and great players, whether they felt it or what, but they knew when they were against that left side earlier, they could hit the ball quicker, faster, and straighter. And that's what this is about. You know, it's, it's it's just it's almost bath, and and it in its simplicity, it helps people that aren't that don't have great eye hand coordination hit this golf ball and put some compression against it, and that's what that's what this that's what this is all about. You can also hear it once you've made contact with the ball and you've hit it properly. You can definitely yeah, you hear the ball difference. divot. You know, I mean, you're not hitting divot ball. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you put the club behind the ball, as I said to you and Neil. If I were to bring the club right straight back to this uh, in motion, I would hit the divot and then I hit the ball. So you, we've got to we've got to move a little forward so that we can hit the ball on the downswing and then the divot. So there there is a forwardness in the motion on the downswing. If you, if you stay behind the ball like we've all been told, you're going to hit behind the ball because that's that's where the bottom of the swing is. So you've got to move that bottom a little forward. Uh, no matter if you shift to the right or the left, you got to end up against the left when you hit it. So this, uh, I think a lot, a lot of the great left side players realize that if I stayed, if they stayed against the left and coil their body and then uncoil it, uh, they can make contact more consistently. And I think that's what, what I, I see and, and, and what I hear when I'm giving a lesson. I can hear ball divot. Mm -hmm. And and also, um, I, I need to get this clarified because it was a point that you're making when you were speaking with Neil about having your, uh, for a right-handed golfer, your right shoulder pointing down the line towards your target when you're finished with your swing. And yet I've heard so many people talking about having your belt buckle pointing at the target. Well, well look, we're, we're unwinding our core mm -hmm. through, through impact. Mm -hmm. And you could watch anybody into her, especially the ladies, because they're more flexible than the men. But everybody's chest is left of the target. And, and, and you, you want to turn as far left of the target with your chest. As long as your left arm is connected, it'll be coming behind that movement. And you want to turn as far left as you can. Just like in the back swing, when you coil one way, you get your back to the target. When we go through the ball, we want to get our chest left of the target with the right shoulder pointing at the turret. And it doesn't hurt the back to do this because that's how we're built. It's when you drop those shoulders down, okay, and, you, and the left shoulder goes up and the right shoulder goes down, it, it, different than at address. Now you're going to be tweaking your back. I don't believe in tilting the shoulders at all in the golf swing, in the golf swing because I think you hurt your back. Uh, and, and not only that, but the width of your swing gets narrower. And the, the, the wider the path, the farther they hit. So when we're rotating a little bit more level, then the arms follow the body around, and you, you end up around the body instead of in front of the body. Uh, you know, when I first learned to play golf, we finished real high with the hands. Not anymore. And you don't see anybody finishing high with the hands, or, or, or most, not very many if they do at all. And um, we should also, you know, establish some credibility here beyond your 61 and all the work that you've done. To, you're, you're the coach of the College of the Desert um, golf team, and you were telling me about the uh, dynasty that you have with that program. What is it? Eight, 
the, the program has won the regionals how many years in a row now? Uh, 23 years straight. Uh, <laughs> and and, keep, and remember, this is a two-year school, so we've got a new golf team every two years. Wow. Uh, so we're doing we're doing something pretty good now. And you've I been with the program that. for eighteen years. I've been I've been teaching the golf team for eighteen years. I've been been with the college twenty five. Okay. So for my eighteen years, I've won three state championships, uh, eighteen conference championships, and numerous regional championships. Um, and it's not just me, obviously. You know, it's we have great weather here, great golf courses. I get some good players, but I think that I I'm good at mentoring. I'm good at making them oh, feel absolutely. comfortable with themselves on the golf course. And that leads us right back to um, want to wrap this up and let people know once again, go to golfsmarter.com and please purchase Tony's book for a number of reasons. One, it's going to improve your golf game. Boy, you know, number one, it's going to improve your game. Also, this is self-published by Tony. He's doing this on his own. Um, he's, uh, that's why we don't have it on Amazon. That's why it's not on Audible. Um, but it is right through Tony himself. The book is twenty dollars and it's four ninety five for shipping within the United States. Outside the United States, it's going to be a little more for shipping, um, but it is so simple, so clean, and so helpful, so clear, so concise. It's called "The Lost Fundamental: One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever" by Tony Manzoni with Paul Cervantes. Tony, as always, I really enjoy having you come on to Golf Smarter. Thank you so much for sharing all your information with us. Fred, I thank you, too. Your, your program is just fantastic, and what a wonderful thing for people to be able to download uh, crazy people like myself and, and other people and get some golf information and have some fun with this wonderful sport. Well, you know, these crazy people, we flock together. <laughs> That's right, now. Take care of yourself. Don't miss it. It's the very first video of Tony Manzoni on YouTube. Golf Smarter TV is the place to see the highlights of Tony's lesson with Neil. Trust me, just this taste of Tony's method will improve your ball striking. Wow. I've definitely gone through different microphones over the years. Can you tell the difference? No, oh, I can. That's my job. So if it wasn't obvious, this was a replay of episode number 291, which was published originally on July 26, 2011. As a reminder, this and next week's episodes are being brought back because the Lost Fundamental book is finally available again. I'll leave the link in today's show notes to purchase the book on Amazon, or you can just search for Tony Manzoni or Paul Cervantes, who we heard last week, while in Amazon. Again, the book is called The Lost Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever. And it's available in Kindle format for only $6.99 or paperback for only $9.99 U.S. Uh, up next, we'll go back to another of Tony's classic lessons, episode number 408, originally published on October 29, 2013. Now, there's a couple of reasons I wanted to replay these two Tony Manzoni episodes. Obviously, because he was a great teacher who was beloved by the Golf Smarter community but also because I wanted to share with you some of the older episodes that are so hard to find and let you know there's a lot more where that came from. Well, I've told you that before, that you can go into the archives, but my goodness, it's so hard to find them. And iTunes and most podcast and all podcast aggregators or podcast apps, they don't care anything more than 300 episodes. And we're, cl we're closing in on 700 episodes, so there's a lot of stuff that if you've not been around since the beginning, you'll want to hear them. And if you have been around for years and years, yeah, BJ, how are you? If you've been around for so long, you may want to hear them again because they've got a lot of value. Anyway, starting in April of this year, I'm going to launch a new Golf Smarter podcast of your favorite lessons and stories from our archives so you don't have to go looking for them. More on that as we get closer. But if you have any thoughts as what to call it, I'm definitely listening. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for names, follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Golf Smarter, or click on the Hey Fred button at GolfSmarter.com.